So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Perry Bartlett. Before um, I formally introduce him, I'd like to say, give a little anecdote of something that I'm telling people now, which is that in travel magazines, you read now that um, Warsaw is the new Berlin, meaning like, you know, very sophisticated and hip and trendy, and now Berlin is kind of a past its time, and now Warsaw is the new Berlin. So when people ask me from outside of the States about medical research in Australia, I say that uh, Brisbane is the new Melbourne. And that's <laughs> in great part, um, and Professor Perry Bartlett is one of the biggest uh, contributors to that with the Queensland Brain Institute. So Professor Bartlett was appointed Foundation Chair in Molecular Neuroscience at the University of Queensland in 2002, and he's the inaugural director of the Queensland Brain Institute, which he was appointed to in 2003. He's renowned in the field of cellular and molecular neuroscience, a fact highlighted by his election as a fellow of the Australian Academy and the awarding of a prestigious Australian Research Council Federation Fellowship in 2003. Professor Bartlett has published more than 180 peer-reviewed papers and is the recipient of the John Woodward Prize for Excellence in Neuroscience, which he got in 1991, and the Bethlehem Griffith Research Medal and Prize in 2000. He is also past president of the Australian Neuroscience Society and has served as an executive member of IBRO and FAONS. So it's a great pleasure to have here uh, now Professor Bartlett. Thank you. Well, Julio, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, firstly, for the introduction, but also for organizing uh, this meeting. Uh, I, I'm so happy that it's going to be uh, an annual event and that uh, each year we can come back and perhaps uh, progress from T0 to T1. Not sure I'll, I'll ever get to T3 or T4, but at least, uh, at least the, uh, uh, the initiation will be there. Um, Brisbane perhaps is the new Melbourne. I have to admit, when I first moved to Brisbane and, and we called it the Queensland Brain Institute, my Melbourne colleagues thought that was an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> but... But having said that, uh, um, certainly, uh, certainly the last 10 years of research in uh, Queensland has been a remarkable uh, spring of which uh, has now generated an enormous amount of enthusiasm and great science, and it's just wonderful to see that spreading across the nation. And I think neuroscience in general has really had an enormous kick in the last five years through a number of new institutes, uh, many of which are, institu uh, are, uh, are here today. Your introduction this morning also reminded me a little bit of an anecdote of talking about taking over from Julius Axelrod because I, I always remember that the tale someone told me when Julius won the Nobel Prize and they, won his, they rang his mother in New York who was a, a typical uh, Jewish lady and they said, uh, she answered the phone and I said, oh, congratulations, Jewish, Julie, Julius, uh, Dr. Axelrod has won the prize and she was somewhat phlegmatic and sort of said yes, and, and I said, but you must be incredibly proud and excited. And she, and she said, uh, yes, I am, but of course he's not a real doctor. <laughs> so um, Ju Julius, unfortunately, had done a PhD rather than an MD, which uh, ju ju just goes to show you that we need, to, we need to raise the profile of science but through translation, I believe, in, t in terms of curing disease in order to... Uh, uh, receive that due, uh, ac uh, the due accolade. So um, what I'm going to talk today about, somehow I've got a smaller screen, but um, is our work that's been going on for a while, looking at how we might be able to use uh, the precursor populations in various parts of the brain to address diseases. And particularly, I'm not going to talk about what has dominated perhaps the, uh, the, po the popular press, the idea that you can stimulate or transplant cells to repair or regenerate the brain. I'm going to take the, the view that perhaps many of the diseases that um, um, might, uh, might oppress us are due to, in fact, dysregulation of the production of neurons and that that dysregulation or malfunction offers an opportunity through stimulation to address, address diseases like dementia and depression. Uh, before I start, I just thought I'd quickly tell you about uh, the QBI. I mean, although we started in 2003, we only moved into this uh, new building uh, uh, three years ago, and I had the privilege of being able to recruit a whole new cohort of people, really with the idea of, of uh, 
basically addressing these questions of understanding what regulates brain function. Again, with the idea, Julio, that of course uh, we needed to get this right in order to be able to generate new therapies and therapeutics to treat the avalanche of neurological disease in our community. Um, we, we concentrated on, uh, we, we've uh, recruited people from all fields working in all models, from Drosophila through C. elegans, uh, through honeybees to humans, who are now working cheek to jowl on different models of, uh, of learning and memory and disease uh, situation, which I must say is now starting to pay enormous dividends, getting that dialogue going not only between clinical people, but people who use different models to address the same question. Uh, these are the areas in, in the research groups that uh, are, currently, uh, are currently at QBI. There's a broad range of diseases we're addressing, again, with that, fundamental, with that fundamental premise that we need to understand brain function in order to address those diseases. Julio also made the, the important point about how you do translate from animal work. It's, it's very difficult. One of the models and one of the ways that uh, one of the things we've invested in very heavily, because I think it is one of the few ways of translating animal work into humans, is, in, is through, uh, through new imaging technology, where one can literally image down to single cells in, in animal brains and start to, to, uh, to uh, get resolution in human, uh, not, not quite as close as that, but certainly very defined resolution. So in this way, we should be able to develop very defined maps of uh, brain function, both in terms of pathways, in terms of fMRI, and, uh, and in terms of uh, very high-definition imaging, whereby we can start translating those behavioural responses and also therapies and activities directly from animals to brain. And uh, I welcome all of you to uh, make use of the facilities we've developed at, uh, at the University of Queensland, which we now have a 16.4 Tesla animal, which allows us to image down to 20 microns. We uh, are getting a 9.4 MRI animal magnet, uh, a 7 Tesla whole body human, and a 3 Tesla, and one of the world's first pet MRI animal uh, um, machines. So we, we've invested incredibly heavily in this area to try and uh, not just put Queensland, but put Australia at the forefront of this imaging technology to take advantage of what's going to happen in the next 10 years as we move from the test tube into real animal trials. So the problem that uh, I talk about today is obviously this ageing problem, and ageing dementia to some degree, that is that by 2050, approximately 13 to 15% of the population is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, over 65. In fact, a large percentage is going to be over 85, with the estimate that ageing dementia will have about 1.3 million people by 2050. Obviously, uh, other diseases are also important in the sense that perhaps some of the, some of the processes that underlie those diseases may be reversible through activating precursor populations and causing increase in neuronal production. What I'm going to talk about today is obviously very nascent and uh, um, uh, um, hopefully will lead to, uh, to, to some of those uh, therapeutics. The idea that one could make new neurons in the brain, even in the adult brain, even in the ageing brain, is not new. Uh, we've known for many, many years that there was mitotic activity in the CNS and, in fact, quite convincingly was shown in, uh, in songbirds by Nottenbaum in, in the early 80s, but also when one looks back at Altman's work in the 60s, he clearly showed that there was uh, populations of neurons and glia that were generated from, uh, from dividing cells. We came into this field in 92, whereby we were able to show that there were cells, precursor cells in the adult brain, that were able to give rise to new neurons in the test tube and subsequently in the animal. Uh, the assay that became the, the gold standard is this neurosphere assay, which was developed by uh, Reynolds and Weiss in the same year of uh, 92, in which they could take a single cell. Now, you can take these single cells from uh, various, in A, from various parts of the brain. It's not just the, uh, the subventricular zone and the hippocampus I'm going to talk about today, but it's now very clear that many areas in the brain have precursors capable of dividing and giving rise to neural cells, including neurons and oligodendrocytes. Uh, 
But the first uh, discoveries were uh, based around the subventricular zone, uh, which uh, gives rise to cells in the olfactory bulb. And the point here I want to make is that a single, a single precursor can give rise to many hundreds of thousands of, of neurons, which uh, those, uh, those large balls of cells called neurospheres can be split and re repropagated, such that a single cell we added up one day could give rise to a couple of hundred billion cells in its lifetime. So the point is that you don't need many of these cells within the brain to be able to regenerate enormous amounts of uh, new neural tissues, so the idea that you might have to transplant something back in perhaps is uh, something that's not going to be required. Uh, very quickly after discovering that there were those precursors in the subventricular zone, it was shown in the olfactory bulb that uh, there are interneurons that migrate down uh, the migratory stream. I don't think this is working. Can't see that. Migrate from the subventricular zone along the rostral migratory stream into the olfactory bulb where they form interneurons that sit between the uh, olfactory sensory cells and the mitral cells, such that the olfaction, the olfactory receptors are out here on the mucosa, and these cells sit between, the, uh, between those uh, sensory cells and the, the mitral cells conveying that information to the brain. The exact the exact nature of the purpose of those cells, but there are many hundreds of thousands of these cells generated on a daily basis in, uh, in the brain. The exact, uh, the exact role of that is still not clear, but it appears to be to help fine-tune the olfactory signal uh, uh, under various conditions. Um, we, we then went on to purify this population in 2001 and uh, study uh, how it was regulated in the subventricular zone. But what I want to talk about today is work in the hippocampus, because I think, of course, the hippocampus does uh, many, uh, many functions that, of course, uh, are somewhat more, uh, uh, have more gravitas than the olfactory bulb in terms of our behaviour, especially in learning and memory. So uh, it, it's now known that within the, uh, within the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, um, Within the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, here's a coronal section through, through the hippocampus, that there are cells that are actively dividing and forming new neurons. Now, the hippocampus, as you all know, is a region of the brain in which uh, learning takes place, especially episodic, episodic learning, that is, where and when something occurs, and is very important in terms of navigation of animals and humans. It's a type of, uh, type of uh, learning um, that uh, tends to, tends to uh, decline in the elderly and of course this idea of, of neurogenesis has been strongly linked to uh, perhaps uh, being involved in that learning process. It's known from the work of Gould very early on that in fact the amount of neurogenesis occurring in the dentate was regulated by learning events as well as being regulated by things like exercise and other environmental issues. More recently, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data, it's now clear that, uh, well, it's becoming clear that the production of these, of these neurons in response to these uh, response to the stimuli may be very important for encoding uh, some of those memories. And in fact, there's a large number of studies now where attempts are to knock out the cells uh, and, and, and assess the animal's ability to uh, perform in learning and memory tasks. So the key questions, and I'm not going to address many of these today, but the key questions in this whole hippocampal neurogenesis field, which is, again, very nascent and a lot of questions remain unresolved, is what is the, the role in learning and memory and what types? What is the mechanism? What is the mechanism by which these new neurons might influence uh, memories? Uh, it appears the, the current hypothesis is, of course, that these young neurons have the ability to form uh, synapses more easily and, and uh, form uh, uh, LTP, long-term potentiation. What I'm going to concentrate on today is how is the neuronal production regulated? If they really do have a role in this and, and respond to environmental cues and can be, used to, uh, can be used to bolster this memory and learning process, if we understand how this is regulated, perhaps we can use it to stimulate the, the production in, uh, in situations like dementia and, and perhaps even de depression. And, of course, that's my last point here. <coughs> 
So let me just show you some uh, preliminary work we've been doing, some very early work looking at trying to deplete populations of progenitors in the hippocampus using a, a transgenic animal where we can feed it uh, tamoxifen, which binds to the estrogen receptor uh, and translates Cre into the nucleus, whereby it activates the uh, diphtheria toxin receptor, such that any, <coughs> when you feed the animals tamoxifen, the cells, which uh, in this case are nestin, Nestin Cree, where Nestin is expressed by the precursor populations in the dentate, um, they express diphtheria toxin receptor, and when you give them diphtheria toxin, you can deplete these, these cells specifically because it's the human diphtheria toxin, which has about a, a three log higher affinity for diphtheria than the mouse receptor. So here's the studies we've been doing in association with Trevor Kilpatrick and Toby Merson. We feed them tamoxifen to induce, and then we give them diphtheria toxin for seven days, and then we look at the number, whether we've reduced the, the precursors and then uh, test them out in terms of behavioural characteristics. As you can see, this is pretty efficient, although I must admit it is variable. You could knock out uh, 80 to 90 per cent of the populations in the subventricular zone, the olfactory bulb, and the hippocampus. When we assess these animals for in water maze learning, that is the ability of the animal to find a hidden platform in a, uh, in a, in a swimming pool, you can see that the ablated, ablated animals, in, after seven days of, of uh, multiple trials, failed to do this, whereas the controls uh, learn in this case. It's also clear when you take the, the uh, hidden platform away that the ablated males aren't able to uh, remember where that it is, whereas the controls spend all their time swimming around looking for it. So this is, uh, this is one of the studies. There are now many studies that are published by other groups which show effects on ablating uh, hippocampal uh, neurogenesis, although many of them have caveats associated with using irradiation or antimitotic events which tend to confound the event. So what is the regulation of neurogenesis if it is important to functions like this? Is there, a, is, there a, is there a cell in the hippocampus that you could call a stem cell, that a cell that is able to self-renew and, and, and uh, retain that ability to produce neurons throughout life? Well, when we first started this back in 2005, we used a similar assay to, we, to what we used in the subventricular zone, whereby you could passage these precursors, as I showed you before, almost ad infinitum. However, in the hippocampus, when we tried to grow these single precursors in vitro, you could only, you could only passage them for about three, three passages or less, indicating perhaps there wasn't a true stem cell in the, in the hippocampus, but cells might, progenitors or precursors with less proliferative capabilities migrated in. Um, so we, we thought about this, and, and we thought about the fact that Gould and many others have shown that... Uh, learning and memory and, and uh, activity activates uh, neurogenesis. So we thought perhaps if we artificially induced a, a, a mimic situ situation of synaptic activity associated with learning and memory, that we might be able to activate the precursors. And we used potassium chloride at 20 millimolar to uh, depolarize, depolarize the, the cultures in a, to mimic the synaptic, uh, synaptic activity. And what we found was that, in fact, there was a three, three and a half fold increase in the number of precursors that you could generate. So about two thirds of the cells, uh, precursors normally weren't activated when one does this assay and uh, are activated through depolarization. Uh, more interestingly, though, was the fact that many of these precursors gave rise to very large, very large uh, uh, colonies or or clones of cells greater than 250 micron in diameter, that is, they contain many, many cells. And as you can see here, the, the, the uh, smaller one is the traditional neurosphere generated from a single cell without potassium, and here are these humongous balls of cells that were generated from a single cell in potassium. And a large number of these, or it's greater than 36%, it's about 50% now, can be passaged, that is, they can be divided, and secondary spheres can be be, uh, 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 can arise about 50% of the time. Also very interesting was that in the, uh, these spheres don't normally give rise to uh, beta tubular neuronal cells, whereas, I don't know if you can see this, but the, these cells contain, these spheres contain many, many uh, beta tubulin positive cells. So there seems to be, in this population, 
uh, in the hippocampus, what we would think is a latent population of, of precursor cells that one no that's not normally dividing and one can't read this out. To test whether there was a latent precursor pool, we used cytosine ar arabinoside, a mitotic blocker, in, uh, pulse this in and show that you could ablate virtually all the, the uh, precursor activity in vitro of the non-potassium activated cells, whereas you only had a mild effect on the, uh, on the uh, depolarized uh, activation effect. So it appears that the hippocampus con does contain stem cells. There's not many from this assay. It appeared to be somewhere between 8 and 10 per hippocampus. As I'll show you in a minute, that, that seems to be a low, a low estimate. And that the majority of these true stem cells and the majority of even the uh, progenitor cells also normally are not dividing and are in a latent state. Indicating perhaps, as I'll show you in a minute, that, that uh, they, may be, they may require some synaptic activity in order to activate these cells in order to give rise to those neuronal populations. So um, interestingly also that the population activated in the hippocampus is dissimilar to that in the subventricular zone, the, the area that gives rise to the olfactory neurons in that it was in fact inhibited by depolarization. One of many characteristics that indicates that this precursor is different than that found in the subventricular zone and different from many other precursors in other parts of the nervous system. Now as I alluded to at the start, there appears to be a change uh, with age in terms of uh, the production of neurons, and here's a picture of a hippocampus stain for the production of neurons with double cortin, a marker turned on just after neuronal differentiation and just before they've, they've matured. That's a two-month-old animal. By, by six months, uh, you can see that there's a, a marked reduction in that population. And by, by 18 months of age, uh, when a, a, a mouse or a rat is getting old in the tooth, in fact, there's virtually uh, very little production of, uh, uh, of neurons in those animals. And of course, those animals show quite, uh, uh, quite substantial loss in terms of their navigation ability and learning and memory. The good news in terms of if this is associated with, with uh, your ability to learn and uh, form memories is that although the number of precursors declines dramatically uh, over about 18 months, the ability to activate this latent population remains intact, even in the very old animal, so that this so the machinery is still there. It just appears that the agents which activate this precursor to produce neurons are either no longer uh, there, or in fact, uh, the, uh, the, re the receptors on the stem cells no longer respond to those, uh, those agents. So that's very much uh, where much of our research now is focused, how to activate those populations. So what I've told you is all in vitro. Might this occur in vivo? This is some very uh, recent work that's not as yet published, whereby we've tried to look to see if this latent population could be also activated by things that, uh, that are related to synaptic activity. A very talented neurosurgeon, Masahiro Kamita, did these studies in mice where we stimulated the, the perforant po uh, pathway and, uh, and recorded from the, the dentate gyrus uh, using uh, in either 250 hertz trains uh, of 200 milliseconds or 400 hertz trains and compared that to a number of controls to induce, uh, to induce LTP. He was successful in, in many cases to be able to induce LTP over a sustained length of time here. We used blockers of NMDA re receptors, CPPP here, and we had animals that uh, we stimulated with low frequency, 1 hertz, uh, um, stimulation or LT animals which in fact LTP failed to occur. Surprisingly when we looked at these animals, so we killed these animals uh, 48 hours later, removed their cells from the hippocampus and asked whether those precursors had been activated by LTP or other stimulatory activities and uh, very surprisingly we found it was only in, in, uh, in LTP activated uh, uh, occurrences that we got this activation of these precursors, about a five-fold increase, somewhat even higher than the potassium. In fact, it turns out to be higher than we can activate in vitro. And in fact, uh, adding, adding more potassium was not able to activate any more of those in, vi in, in vitro. Interestingly, CPP blocked, uh, uh, blocked all that activity, even the, even the background levels 
low frequency stimulation, one hertz didn't do anything, and those animals that had been given that 250 or 400 hertz but failed to induce LTP also didn't show that increase. So it does appear, very surprisingly, but it does appear that the activation of this population of precursors is dependent on specific uh, 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 synaptic activity associated with long-term potentiation, which of course, as you know, although again controversial because there's many types of LTP associated with, uh, with learning and memory uh, uh, facilitation. So that data is very exciting and of course how that LTP, why that LTP is required in terms of uh, activation of those cells is one of the things we're following up. Again, this led to an increase in the production of uh, double cortin cells uh, which were dividing so that we got an increase in it with LTP but not with the, with the others, an increase in the number of BRDU double cortin cells and uh, I can't quite read that one. But um, uh, again, um, th this was consistent with the activation of precursors. I should say there's a slight disconnect here because, as you can see, we're activating enormous numbers of precursors, including, including some stem cell activation, although that's not as, as, uh, as uh, profound as it is in vitro. You'd expect this thing to go crazy. You'd expect hundreds of thousands of new neurons being generated. That's not the case. It looks as if this... Niche, this, uh, uh, this um, um, uh, this production of neurons is very tightly regulated and we now know there are many, many negative regulations, regulators within that niche that may, uh, may dampen this down. So precisely how you take it from, um, from precursor activation through to a vast neurogenic population is something we still haven't solved but we're getting a little closer to understanding. So, um, it appears that uh, not only uh, in vitro uh, activation, but also in vivo activation, linked to uh, synaptic activity, but importantly linked to long-term potentiation type synaptic activity, activates these precursors. So what might be the mechanism through which this activation occurs? It could be uh, one of many we've shown. I haven't shown you the data, but in fact it's dependent on L-type calcium channels. It could be dependent on neurotransmitter release, growth factor, etc., etc., from those neurons. What we have found is that the condition medium from the potassium activated cells is able to also uh, induce uh, the, the latent uh, precursors to divide, so it does appear to lead to a release of a factor. And one of those factors we now know is, uh, is, uh, is WINT3A, which has been shown to be released from uh, synaptic junctions. By, uh, by synaptic activity. It's also been shown by the gauge group to be a regulator of neurogenesis. So this is one of the factors, there are, there are at least three or four factors that appear to be released by synaptic activities that regulate neurogenesis. Again, uh, as I showed you before, the, even in the adults, even in the old animal, the 12 month old animal, we're able to show that WIN3A is able again to activate this latent population. Another molecule, prolactin, which also appears to be released, also does the same thing. So activation of neurons appears to lead to release of growth factors that directly activates the uh, precursor population. Parenthetically, I should say that also, interestingly, exercise is a fantastically good thing for, um, for activation of these precursors. This is, in fact, in the subventricular zone, but uh, 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 Dan Blackmore, a postdoc in the lab, has also shown this in the hippocampus, that running animals for 21 days is able to activate um, a number of precursor populations, latent precursor populations, don't despair. The 24 month, month one is, uh, is, is now overcome. It, depend, it, it totally depends on how long you run these animals. If you run them for another, another week and a half, you activate quite large numbers in the very old animal. It's a result that uh, pleased me greatly when he got it. So uh, again, we don't know if exercise works through the release and, and synaptic activity, release of factors, but there is evidence that both prolactin and growth hormone are important in regulating that, uh, that activity. Okay, so <clears throat> what about other factors? What, what about neurotransmitters? Could there be a role for neurotransmitters in hippocampal responses? And this is where the, uh, the link with depression uh, comes about. It's been known for a long while that obviously uh, 
uh, stress and depression leads to hippocampal uh, uh, loss and, and loss of proliferation. And on the other hand, uh, antidepressants have been shown to increase uh, hippocampal neurogenesis uh, in terms of SSRI and NRIs. A very controversial paper, which still remains controversial, was published in 2003, which indicated that if you blocked Santorelli et al., if you blocked uh, hippocampal uh, neurogenesis by using irradiation, you blocked the effect of, uh, of both uh, serotifluoxetine, SSRI, and also an NRI activity, indicating that perhaps the, the the, uh, the mode of action of these antidepressants was by activating neurogenesis. That remains uh, still controversial, and although some, some of it has been repeated, uh, certainly some aspects, clearly some aspects of the antidepressant activity are not due to that. So we've been looking recently whether there's any, any direct action of these molecules on the precursor population, whether they can directly activate neurogenesis in the hippocampus, if that is true. So Denisha Javeri, a postdoc, has been looking using um, a, sphere, a, a slice assay whereby she's been able to slice up the hippocampus, put them, these are, these are young hippocampi, put them into culture and add uh, various uh, SSRI and NRIs in vivo because we've got the, the three-dimensional uh, three environment, then disaggregate those, uh, those uh, slices and uh, uh, assess them for... Uh, neurosphere content to see if they've activated those latent precursor populations. To cut a long story short, it turns out that uh, none of the SSRIs we tested worked and we tested large numbers, whereas the NRIs did activate quite large numbers. And then we went back and just tested either uh, serotonin or norepinephrine. We found that it was only norepinephrine that was able to directly uh, to induce the, uh, the uh, precursor, uh, increase the precursor number from these cells. So then we went directly to the adult situation and to look to see if norepinephrine could activate stem cells in the adult hippocampus using the conventional assay. And here again we found that uh, norepinephrine was able to give us these very large neurospheres. Again, they're clonal from a single cell, making many tens of thousands of neurons. They also... Uh, were, uh, <coughs> were uh, quite large, as you can see there, and um, they, they also were able to be passaged uh, uh, over a long period of time, indicating that they had uh, stem cell activity, and again, they also had large numbers of neurons. In fact, they were able to induce far more neurons than, than the potassium activation. <coughs> so... Um, it appears, excitingly, it appears that this population is an addition to the potassium chloride that is their additive when you use both of these reagents together. And in fact, the number of these very large or stem cell uh, precursors is also additive. So there seems to be two populations of precursors, at least two populations of precursors, one activated by norepinephrine and, and one activated by the results of uh, depolarization, which may be both Wnt3A and prolactin. <laughs> Okay, so we've been looking at whether this uh, activity is direct. Do, do they, does norepinephrine act directly on the precursor or is it indirect? And we've been doing this by first enriching for the precursor population using HES5 expression in a dentate. Uh, HES5 is a downstream marker of notch signal and the HES5 GFP animal, as you can see here, shows beautiful staining within the, in the subgranular zone where all those cells are. And in fact, if we sort for HES5 populations, that uh, all, the, uh, all the response to norepinephrine is in those HES5 populations. So when we do the experiment of, of using uh, these sorted cells to look at the uh, effect of uh, norepinephrine, we find that even at one cell per well, that the frequency of activation of these clones is about 1 in 32 compared to 1 in, in, uh, in uh, 65 in the, in the low cell density, indicating not only is this direct, because this is a single cell, it has to be direct, but also that there aren't other factors released by a higher density cultures which tend to increase those numbers. So norepinephrine is acting directly on the precursor population. We've also been able to show this uh, activation in vivo by st stimulating the locus cerealis, which uh, 
which innovates uh, the hippocampus, uh, sole innovator of the hippocampus, and you can see again that there's an increase in neurogenesis when we do this by stimulating the, uh, the, uh, the LC. We also stimulate the production of, uh, of precursors as well. Now, the last six months uh, or so, the last 12 months, we've been looking at how, through what receptor this is working, and Denisha Javeri is, uh, has, has been uh, assiduous in tracking this down. She first showed that it was, that it was uh, through the beta receptors and it was only prop prop propanolol that was able to block this activity. Um, she's since gone on to look at the various blockers of beta-1, beta-2 and beta-3, and again, to cut a long story short, it's only the beta-3 uh, blockers that in fact are able to uh, in in inhibit the uh, activation of uh, these precursor population. A very surprising finding because beta-3 is usually associated with, uh, with brown fat depots rather than uh, neuronal or, or neurological responses. <clears throat> so again, we only, to confirm this, we, uh, we sorted cells and looked for the expression of, of the various receptors, and it was only the beta-3 receptor that was found on the HES5 population, where the beta-1 and beta-2 are expressed. More recent work, we've used the, uh, the, uh, the, the agonist of beta-3 to inject into the hippocampus, and again, we've been able to show, using this BRL373, double four, the agonist, that there's an increase in both the precursor but also an increase in neuronal population. So for the first time, and somewhat surprisingly, we've been able to show that norepinephrine uh, directly activates the precursor population in a very dramatic way to produce uh, quite large numbers of neurons. And uh, I guess we're at a stage of trying to uh, uh, test this in, in behavioural and, uh, in, and in animal models of depression to further confirm these results. So it appears that um, <clears throat> norepinephrine stimulates both the stem-like and the precursor population. There is a complication in this story that uh, our collaborators have shown, Vidita Vajra has shown, that in fact the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors appear to act as a... Uh, as a gating mechanism, that is, they appear to inhibit the, um, the precursor differentiation into, into neurons, which perhaps explains some of that disconnect I talked about. That is why sometimes you can get activation of precursors you read out in vitro, but you don't in vivo. It now appears that the, the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors uh, may interfere, and when we block those alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, in fact, there's large numbers of neurons produced. So in summary, what I've told you is that um, uh, in vitro depolarization, which mimics activity, leads to activation of a very large latent pool. It's an enormous pool, and that growth factors like Win3A may be responsible for that. Surprisingly, in vivo activation of the latent pool is dependent on LTP, which links this uh, initial study that, um, that learning and memory appears to be stimulate, stimulatory of this process and that norepinephrine also works uh, directly on these precursors through beta-3 adrenergic receptors. So th there's, a, there's some very interesting implications in terms of uh, possible use, but it also shows for the first time that there are quite discrete populations of precursors that can be activated. So each of which are uh, activated by discrete factors released following synaptic activity. And this could uh, result in the generation of quite specific neuronal populations, neuronal populations that have different characteristics in terms of uh, integration and in terms of forming synaptic activity. So rather than thinking about just regulating the production of neurons, we're now thinking about regulating the specific types of precursors to produce specific types of neurons, which may explain why different environmental signals give different outcomes in this, uh, in this case. So that's where I want to stop and just thank the people who have done this work. Um, <clears throat> Tara Walker, who's uh, now in... Kemperman's lab in Germany did a lot of the work, work on the potassium. Denisha Javeri, who's a, 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 an extant postdoc, is working on the norepinephrine. Uh, where are we? Uh, Masahiro Kamita, who's now back uh, in Japan, uh, vigorously operating as a neurosurgeon. Um, Aaron Mackay, who's, uh, who's a very talented uh, 
young RA who's now in the Netherlands doing a PhD, and all my collaborators, especially Cliff Abraham in Otago and VD de Vajra in, uh, in, uh, in the Tatar Institute in India. And thanks very much. Hi, I'd like to uh, thank Perry for uh, his brilliant presentation and open the floor for discussion. Any questions? Yes. The brown fat linkage is a, is a very interesting one and one that uh, we'd like to explore more. It's, yeah, So the, the studies I showed you, so, so the, the, best, the best data we have is that it takes somewhere from uh, two to four weeks. So if you look at, if you look at uh, when you stimulate uh, the hippocampus and you look for arc expression, which is a pretty good marker of synaptic activity, you find arc in those new neurons at about four weeks. And interestingly, you find a lot greater percentage of those... Uh, newly generated neurons with arc than you do in the background noise. But again, interestingly, after four weeks, the number of those neurons is not that high. So one of the, um, uh, one, one of the, uh, the hookers in all this is, are those new neurons really replacing or uh, becoming permanent fixtures in the, in the hippocampus, or are they turning over themselves? I favour the, the, the hypothesis that, in fact, in the adult animal, as opposed to much of the work which has been done mainly on the young hippocampus where it's still growing. So, you know, the hippocampus is very late in terms of reaching full dimensions, probably, you know, six weeks or so. So uh, you, you, you probably are adding neurons at that stage. But if you look in the older animal, that there's very little evidence that, in fact, you are getting integration of, of those neurons in, into the hippocampus. So I favour the idea that they're there perhaps for a month or two and then they're replaced by the next generation of, of neurons. So um, again, exactly how that... Uh, so, so in terms of the timing of learning, that fits very much with when uh, ablation of, 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 of neurogenesis... If you ablate... Uh, the precursor is about a month before. That's about when you show that decrease. If you ablate close to the event, not so much. But again, what we're trying to do now is ablate neurons that have been generated at various times and see what effect that has on the outcome. But that hasn't been very easy to do for a number of reasons. <clears throat> Peter. Yeah. I'm wondering how are you now thinking about the earlier reports of serotonergic activation yeah. of cell proliferation yeah. since you've just shown us that the gene voting yeah. network can both activate and inhibit? Well, one parsimonious way would be that, uh, and there is evidence, that it might raise levels of norepinephrine. Uh, so that, that's certainly a possibility. 
uh, the other the other answer is perhaps that those experiments aren't as robust as as we once thought in terms of that activation. So there have been quite a number of reports have not shown enormous activation with fluoxetine in terms of neurogenesis. But nevertheless, there does appear to be effect. But clearly, there, there isn't a direct effect within within the uh, niche of the uh, of the uh, precursor population, so it has to be a secondary, uh, a secondary effect. Whether it's through release of norepinephrine, I mean, a number of these reagents are dirty, so they activate a number of. Uh, I don't mean to, to be rude about those reagents, but um, e exactly what what the mechanisms are uh, in terms of the, the downstream signalling is, is a bit vague. But again, this is this is Tiger Country game very much in terms of reports of what activates and what doesn't activate neurogenesis. I was wondering, what does an environment that's stimulating have? What effect does that have versus a non-stimulating effect? Well, in, a, in an animal, profound, profound, so that... Uh, you can show quite uh, profound changes in neurogenic rates by changing the environment of the animal. Now, there is a, there is a second part to the story, which again is a little unclear, is that a large number of those neurons generated, as, as is true developmentally, don't make it. There's a lot of cell death goes on. So part of the environmental stimuli may be not so much in terms of activating neuronal thing, but in fact keeping those neurons alive because clearly uh, work from our lab and Lizzie Coulson and many other labs has shown that, that one of the cell death pathways is, is reduced by synaptic activity. So if these new neuro new neurons are made and they don't receive activation in some ways, which is coming from environmental, I mean this is being totally you know, hand waving here which is coming from uh, environmental influences, they'll die. So that there, there, again, there are studies to show that that rate of cell death is reduced if you put animals in a so-called enriched environment versus a non-enriched. So it may well be a combination of increased survival as well as uh, regulation of neurogenesis. And as I've said, if, it may be that different environmental signals give you different populations of neurons. Uh, uh, so it may be much more complicated than we ever thought. <clears throat> Two Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, that's that is a problem. Um, that is a problem. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, the behavioural literature is just amazing, isn't it, in terms of uh, uh, being uh, uh, either usually female or male, but male often. But in, in, in running experiments, of course, it's female because you house them separately or in low numbers. Um, in mice, females make a lot more neurons than, than males. C57 black is the best. Creme de la creme. So there are some strains which make very low levels and that genetics has actually been started, has, has, has been looked at by back crossing, I think between DBA is the lowest and C57. So there's been a fair bit of back crossing trying to look at genetic association without much, without much joy. In humans we know, we know it occurs and um, uh, you know again anecdotal data fits with the idea that coming back to the gentleman's question up the back, is that the so-called hippocampal shrinkage, again, this is whole hippocampal, which is, you know, a bit bizarre because no one's really measuring dentators yet. One of the things that we hope to do with, uh, with imaging is being able to measure dentate accurately. But there is data, of course, showing that there is hippocampal shrinkage with ageing that is so, perhaps associated with uh, learning and memory loss, and that those populations those people which have so-called leader a more enriched life through uh, language and travel seem to have lesser shrinkage. But of course, whether that's the, the chicken or the egg, no one knows. But again, we desperately need to have some markers of being able to both very good uh, cognitive testing coupled with some uh, 
other markers hopefully imaging i mean fmri uh, there are <coughs> there are other agents coming on the market in terms of nano not for humans but for animals to look directly at activation of populations within the hippocampus but again it, it's going to be hard translating translating that. Very good question. As I said, growth hormone appears to be um, uh, one of the factors that uh, regulates this locally. And, of course, that could be released from uh, various, various sources. Um, I, I think the answer is we simply, we simply don't know. We know, it, we know it is exercise. It's not just visual input. Um, it, is, it is exercise, and it's quite lengthy exercise, so those animals run about five or six kilometres overnight. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, it's, it's too far for, for, for us to run. So, um, uh, but it would be good, very good to dissect exactly what the stimuli are. I mean, I, th I think if it is linked to the same mechanisms I've been talking about in terms of release of factors, we, we will find that out in terms of blocking and things like that. But, you know, this is a gulf between rehabilitation and basic neuroscience is a, is a very big one. Okay. Thank you very much.